Thank you, Larry. Congratulations, Mariana. Spectacular event. Uh, and welcome. Um, it's a real pleasure to be talking about these important issues with such a distinguished cast. In fact, so distinguished, uh, it was a bit difficult for me to think about how I would... Thank you very much. That is water, yeah? yeah. <laughs> Pity. Um, test it. You test it. A different lens through which to view these issues. Uh, but I'm going to try. I'm going to try to view these issues through a different lens. Uh, in particular, uh, the lens of ancient history and modern finance. Uh, through the lens of evolutionary biology uh, and behavioral psychology. And through the lens of Kentucky Fried Chicken and McDonald's Hamburgers. Uh, I will explain, I hope. Uh, by the end. But let me start with a secret. Um, with a secret. So I'm an, I'm an economist. Um, that's not the secret. The secret is that economists know only one thing. So if an economist ever tells you they know more than one thing, they're exaggerating <laughs> by a factor of at least two. <laughs> anyway, the one thing is this. Uh, today's investment is tomorrow's growth. Okay, I'll repeat it. Today's investment is tomorrow's growth. I'm flipping it round. The key to medium-term growth is investment. I know that sounds like a really small thing. It turns out it's got massive implications for long-term wealth and welfare. And let me illustrate with a simple example. Let's take two countries. Let's call them China and Italy. As recently as 1990, those two countries had pretty much the same GDP measured at purchasing power parity exchange rates. But then let's set these two countries off on different trajectories for investment. Let's have China invest at double digit rates for 20 plus years, and Italy invest at rates of below 2% year on year. Fast forward to today. We find today that China has a GDP that is seven times that of Italy. China creates a new economy the size of Italy every two years. It creates a new economy the size of Greece every quarter. It creates a new economy the size of Cyprus every week. So a low GDP may not be all that matters, as economists were waking up to that. It still matters a lot if, generation by generation, we want to have rising living standards. Now today, societies have become terribly accustomed to living standards rising generation by generation. But actually, that isn't the rule. For much of human history, that has been the exception. We have believe it or not, measures of global GDP right back to 1 million BC. 1 million BC. There were relatively few statistical agencies at that time, uh, and their numbers were even less reliable than today's. <laughs> Nevertheless, the patterns revealed over that span of history are striking and revealing and dramatic. So up to around 50,000 BC, as best we can tell, GDP per capita was pretty much flat. Nothing had happened. Generation after generation, living standards had not improved. Things improved after that. So between around 50,000 BC and 1750 AD, the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, world GDP per capita had doubled. In other words, the annual growth rate had picked up to a heady 0.0025% per year. Economists today would call that anemic. <coughs> but actually then, it must have been transformational. The first time in history where generation by generation, living standards were improving. From 1750 onwards, we know what happened. We entered a third era of golden growth. Since then, GDP per capita has ri risen 40-fold. Annual per capita GDP has risen 
8%. On average, that means each generation is around a third better off than its predecessors. So, next question, what explains these very long run secular shifts in growth rates? Well, lots of things, but let me give you one important one. So something very ha important happened to humans around 50,000 years ago. So back then, Neanderthal man died out, and Homo sapiens, modern humans, <coughs> came to dominate. That meant that the prominent brow ridges, the flat foreheads of Neanderthal men, were replaced by the straight, upright foreheads of modern Homo sapiens. This is going somewhere, don't worry. <laughs> it's not even a joke. <laughs> and, but they did this for a reason. This physiological change was for a reason. Because that development in head shape was to accommodate the prefrontal cortex here in the upper forehead. And we now know from modern neurology that it's the prefrontal cortex that's responsible for patience. It's responsible for deferred gratification. It holds the key to investment. So after that time, what did we see? We saw investment. In primitive societies, it was in the very basics, food, health, defense, but also in institutions which helped sustain those basics, families, tribes, civilizations. Fast forward after 1750, there were further great leaps forward. In one sense, they were different. They were industrial rather than agrarian. But in a deeper sense, this was the same mix of physical, human and social capital formation, this time underpinned by a different set of institutions, schools, governments, judicial systems, even central banks. What those, what that ancient history demonstrates for me is the importance above all else of one very basic individual and societal attribute, and that attribute is patience, the willingness to defer gratification, to build physical, human, and social capital, to create and sustain institutions, to innovate. Patience, we're all told, is a virtue. And recent experimental evidence has brought home just how much of a virtue patience be. We now know, for example, that patient people, as you might expect, are more likely to save and invest than to spend. But they're also more likely to stay on in higher education, to have a job, to join a gym, to save on energy. If Vince is still here, but to vote. Most interestingly, perhaps of all, cross-country evidence suggests that patient societies are much more likely to invest in technological innovation. So given its importance, you might naturally ask the question, what is it that determines the patience of individuals or of societies? Well, there's a whole bunch of stuff. The evidence is revealing again on this. It's, it's the things you expect. It's age, it's income, it's wealth, it's culture, none of which are easy to change. But there's one last thing that's as important as all of those in determining patience. And that's the environment for decision making. That includes the role of government and other institutions in nurturing patient decision making, creating incentives to save and invest, creating institutions that promote education and skills creating infrastructures that support innovation, and providing nudges which shape long-term behavior, be it attending a gym or saving on energy. And let me illustrate the importance of how very small interventions can often have quite dramatic impacts on patient decision making. An example which is at the same time both trivial and profound. So a few years ago, a set of psychologists did an experiment. They took some individuals 
and they assessed their decision making and how it was affected by being flashed subliminal images of two iconic 21st century fast food logos. The Golden Arch from McDonald's and Colonel Sanders from Kentucky Fried Chicken. These cues, these nudges, despite not even entering the consciousness of those answering the questions, had a dramatic impact on people's patience. So the very sight, the subliminal sight of Colonel Sanders was sufficient to raise people's discount rates by a third. Fast food made for fast thought. And the deeper point here is that labor-saving technologies, including fast food, are meant to nurture patients. They're meant to stretch time. But in fact, in practice, they appear to do the precise opposite. They encourage the fast thinking part of the brain. And it's not just fast food. You take the most important time-saving technology of our lifetimes, the World Wide Web, and that's believed by many people, some people, to have induced a neurological rewiring that has shortened decision-making spans. And whether it's the rise in payday lending or the rise in attention deficit disorders, or it's the fall falling rates of job and marital tenure, each of those is consistent with society having become somewhat more impatient over time. So then, from fast food to fast finance, because many of those societal trends I've discussed are evident in amplified form when we move to financial markets. Modern capital markets give very little impression of valuing the long term. Instead, they value instant gratification, profits being distributed rather than reinvested. Let me take an example. Public equity markets for raising money for firms to invest. These and the accompanying rise of the public limited company were one of the great innovations of the mid-19th century. Why? Because equity, as a perpetual instrument, ought to be the ideal vehicle for financing long-term investment. Railways, <laughs> manufacturing companies, software houses. And for perhaps a century, that's just the way it worked. Yet today, the omens for public equity markets are much less Encouraging. 50 years ago, the average share was held by the average US investor for seven years. Today, that same share is held for seven months. Equity contributes pretty much nothing to the net new financing of companies here in the UK. To such an extent that McKinsey's think we're actually in the early stages of the death of global equity markets, which naturally begs the question of why. And the reason I would contend is short-termism. Investors in public equity markets value too little long-term pro long projects yielding distant returns and value too much the instant gratification of dividends or stock buybacks, the upshot of which is that companies are put off from investing in high duration, long duration, high risk, high innovation projects in the first place. My own research suggests that those biases, those short termist biases, are big. That they may increase the average required return by as much as 10% each year, which over long horizons can have a very dramatic impact on project choice. Now, if this irrationality was stuck in financial markets, it wouldn't much matter. But it's clear that it is not. If you ask CEOs, if you ask CFOs, they will all give you stories of positive NPV projects having been turned down because of the need to keep short-term investors sweet. And those differences 
Those differences could, over time, translate into massive impacts on the capital stock and on growth. By my back-of-the-envelope calculations, UK output could have been up to 20% higher had those short-termist biases not been there. That's a whole generation's worth of growth. So the final bit, how long have we got, Larry? Carry about yeah, carry just keep going. Keep going. <laughs> I have about, about an, hour, an hour's worth of um, <laughs> material. Um, I'll stop what, when, the, when the lights go out. Um, so the final question then is, so what, right? How do we create this better environment for patient capital? And we'll hear a lot about that over the, last few, over the next few days, and we've already heard quite a lot. But let me offer my three thoughts on areas ripe for reform to tackle this impatience problem. First, taxation and regulation. Why is it that globally the tax code continues to bias against equity and towards debt? That made loads of sense in the 19th century. Today, it makes, for me at least, much less sense. It is a tax on long-termism as far as I can see. And what's true of taxation is true also of regulation. The Secretary of State touched upon this, in particular of pension funds and insurance companies. They are long-term investors, right? In, in principle, they are ideally placed to finance long-term projects. <laughs> Yet regulation in practice tends to attach higher regulatory charges to longer duration projects, even when they do a better job of supporting growth. If you like, regulation weighs risk, but not return. Risk-based regulation and accounting rules also tend to weigh more heavily during slumps, during market slumps. But this perversely is the time when you'd most want patient capital to come to the rescue. Ideally, you want long-term investors acting countercyclically. That is, stepping in to provide capital and take risk when it's cheap. Existing regulatory and accounting rules tend to operate in the opposite direction to that. Now, the good news, because there is some, is that regulation is being reoriented a bit. It's being given a more macroeconomic dimension. We call it macro prudential regulation for that reason. Think of it as regulating for the real economy, for weighing return as well as risk. And what macro prudential regulation can do, I hope, over time, is to create this somewhat more long-term, diverse, set of sources of financing, sources that dampen rather than amplify financial uh, cycles. Second, given that time is short, two, three minutes, two, two minutes, two minutes. <laughs> Just uh, I couldn't count the fingers, Larry. Um, institutions. So you'd expect someone who's worked their whole lives in an institution, which is 320 years old, to say how important they are. And that is what I think. Why? Because they can be patient. They can afford to be patient. And the development banks in this room, of which there are many, are testament to the power of patient, state-backed institutions in catalyzing investment and innovation and in growth. And here in the UK, as the Secretary of State said, the British Business Bank and the Green Investment Bank are charged with a similar task. The catalytic role these institutions can play is more than just financing. It's also about providing those cues, those nudges for innovation. In another experimental study, similar to the fast food one, people were shown not images of McDonald's and, and, and KFC, but of IBM and of Apple. Guess what happened next? Those that were shown subliminally, the Apple image, acted all creative. Those that were shown the IBM image didn't. Small things can make a big difference, and institutions can help deliver that at a societal level. In my remaining minute, Larry, corporate governance, very important. That great 19th century invention that was the PLC placed hands, placed power for the best of reasons 
in the hands of shareholders, precisely because they were there for the long term. But today, those same shareholders are unrecognizable. They are no longer in it for the long term. And that poses a real challenge to the PLC model. Giving primacy to the interests of shareholders may these days come at a cost, the cost of short-termism. What's to be done? Well, there are corporate governance models all over the world that have done a somewhat better job of recognizing a broader set of stake, be it debt holders or workers or customers or suppliers or indeed wider society. Those corporate governance models on average have done a better job of sustaining investment and nurturing innovation. But economists like me, their success comes as no surprise. It's the one thing, perhaps it's the only thing, I really know. Thank you very much.